Good morning, everyone. You will see from the little French accent that I'm from the French part of Montreal. <laughs> but I'm like Michael coming from Quebec. So what I want to do today with you is to talk to you as parents, as psychologists, you know, counselors working with children. And I think that if I talk to you about the way you stress, why you stress, and what you can do about it in 20 minutes, then I'm going to have some good effects on the children. I'm totally certain of this. Let me explain to you why. So me, I have been studying human stress for many years. I have the greatest job in the world. I'm paid to stress people every day. <laughs> it's true. So let me show you what I have learned. So we have been studying this for many years, and in my field, when we're talking about human stress, we seldom ask people if they are stressed, because everyone tells us that, yes, they are stressed because they feel time pressure. But as I will show you today, stress is not time pressure. If it was, how can you explain when you are stressed out when you go to the dentist, for example? There's no time pressure and you're stressed out. Or why you are stressed when you learn about, you know, the disease of your husband, for example. There's no time pressure and still you are stressed out. So when we are studying stress in my field, we're measuring the biological response to stress. Let me show you how it works. So, the first thing you need to understand when we're talking about human stress is the following. The brain, and I'll show you that this is where it starts and this is where it ends. The brain is a detector of threatening information. That's the job of the brain. The, the brain was not created to fill out form 111 on the corner of a desk. It will do so until there's a threat in the environment. The moment there's a threat in the environment, never will your brain allow you to fill up Form 111. All your attention will be on the threatening information. In order to allow you to do the only two things you can do in front of a threat, you fight or you get away. This you learned at college. I will continue the story, okay? So this is how it works. Each time your brain detects a threat, that we call a stress, so stress equals threat, it will produce hormones, the name is not important, that will go and activate two small glands located on top of your kidneys that we call the adrenal glands. When the adrenal glands get the message, boom, they will produce stress hormones. The ones we know these days are glucocorticoids and catecholamines. Again, the name is not important. These stress hormones will allow you to do the only two things you can do in front of the stressor, you fight or you get away. Here's the end of the story. In both cases, whether you decide to, to fight or get away, you need one thing, energy. And it is these stress hormones that gave you the energy in the time of mammoth, uh, in the prehistorical time, to either kill the beast, eat it and survive, or get away if it was too big, and here we are, surviving to mammoth. So never think that stress is negative. Each time is acute, it is positive. The problem with stress is when it becomes chronic, and I'll explain this to you. So we have studied this for many years. We're measuring these stress hormones in blood, saliva, hair, many, many ways. But, uh, you know, a few years ago, we found a second thing. We found that the same stress hormones that you're producing in order to have enough energy to kill the mammoth or get away if it's too big, within a period of eight to 10 minutes, that's fast. These stress hormones will go back to the brain. We never thought they would go back to the brain, but they do. And we found out that when they get back to the brain, they have an interesting preference for the brain regions that are involved in learning and memory, and in emotional regulation. And this started to open up a way, you know, a very large field of research where we have started for many, many years to understand how the chronic production of these stress hormones could lead to mental health disorders. And what we have learned, I'm going to summarize this to you in one sentence, is that each time you're producing stress hormones, they go back to your brain. And the thing is, if you have too many mammoths in your life, each time you have one mammoth, you will produce stress hormones, and they will go back to your brain. And going back to your brain many days in a row, many times a day, these stress hormones will slowly but surely modify the way that you will interpret the next situation so that slowly but surely the glass will become half empty instead of half full. And this is how things like anxiety, depression, and burnout will develop. And we know that stress is not the causal factor of these disease, it's a, it's a vulnerability factor, but we know it is involved in the development of these disorders. So 
all in all, we know the way we get sick with stress and we found this in humans, that's fine. But that was not the most important information because once you know this, what are you supposed to do with this? The most important research results I have seen in this field of research was the following. Okay, so what will make, us, what, what will make people produce the stress hormones? Why is it that you produce stress hormones and you don't in front of the same situation? No two people will produce the same stress response in front of the same situation. So we started to embark in a journey trying to figure out what is it that will have people produce stress hormones. And we found out that there are two types of stress or that will induce a stress response in humans. The first one is what we call an absolute stressor. A mammoth in prehistorical time was an absolute stressor. An absolute stressor is a real threat for survival. Someone comes in here and says, fire! We're not going to start thinking about what to do. We are going to be in the door in 2.5 seconds trying to survive. There's not a lot of absolute stressor these days because we are in a rich environment, healthy. Yet the World Health Organization predicts that by the year 2020, Depression related to chronic stress will be the second cause of invalidity in the world after cardiovascular disease that are related to chronic stress. It doesn't make sense. There's no more mammoth. In all the history of the world, we have never been so safe. Yet, there are some workplaces where you have more than 50% of people that are going to leave uh, work because of chronic stress. So why is it? And we discovered it is because we are now surrounded by relative stressors. Scientists have shown that there are four characteristics of a situation that will induce a stress response, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your age. Your brain doesn't know how old you are, and it doesn't care, by the way. So the same characteristics that stress you will be the same for the children. And if there is only one thing you want to remember from this talk today, this is it, and I'll give you an acronym. So I challenge you to find a situation in your life that you find stressful that you cannot explain by at least one of these characteristics. You won't be able. And what you have to know is that a situation doesn't have to have all four characteristics to induce a physiological stress response. The more you have, the worse it is. So here's the recipe for stress. In order for a situation to induce a stress response, it has to be novel. It has to be unpredicted or unpredictable. It must be threatening to your ego. As someone questioning your capacity to do your job in front of colleagues on a Monday morning at the coffee machine, the little feeling you have going back to your office, it's a stress response. And finally, you must have the feeling you don't have control over the situation. So in order to, for you to remember this, <laughs> it's going to work. Stress, don't go nuts. So novelty, unpredictability, threat to your ego, sense of low control. Now, many people will tell me, Sonia, I understand your nuts story, but I have problems visualizing someone stressing because of the nuts. And moreover, <laughs> and moreover, sorry, that's the French part of it. <laughs> and moreover, you're telling us that when we stress, we mobilize energy. And I will add to this, that once you mobilize energy, it has to go somewhere. So I went onto Google and I found you a little video, 50 seconds, that will show you what it means to stress because of the nuts characteristics. What does it mean, energy mobilization? And once you mobilize energy, what happens with it? So here's the topo. You will see two men in a you know, small office space. And one thinks it's too warm in the room and the other thinks it's too cold. So one will increase the heat and the other one will decrease it. Here we go.
This is usually the part of the conference when you're telling me, Sonia, I'm not that bad, I'm not going to jump on my colleague, and I believe you, but, but, you had a very stressful day, you come back home and you find out yourself shouting at the two children sitting at the dinner table, and in the back of your head you're saying to yourself, this is not what I want to do still. You're shouting. Why? Because each time you are stressed out, you have a st physiological st stress response, so you mobilize energy. Each time you mobilize energy, you have to lose this energy, because if you do not lose the energy that you have mobilized, it will always, always come out as spontaneous anger. You know when you have a spontaneous anger, this is a signal your brain is sending you, saying, there's a mammoth, there's a mammoth. But we don't know about this and we still shout. And this will have an impact and I'll show you this. So for many, many years I tried to find how do we lose control over stress? How do we become depressed? How do we become anxious? How do we become burnout? And we found it. And I'm going to explain this to you in one slide. It's more complicated than this, but you will find that it's not that complicated. So how do we become anxious, depressed, and burnout? Simple. I told you the brain is a detector of threat. Each time the brain detects a, a threat, it will produce the stress hormones. Now, remember, I told you these stress hormones, each time they are produced, go back to the brain. So these stress hormones, by it, so if you are in a chronic stress situation, each time you produce these stress hormones, each time you have a nuts characteristics, you will produce these stress hormones and they will go back to the brain. By going back to the brain day after day after day, many days a week, slowly but surely, these stress hormones will prevent you from being able to discriminate between what is threatening from what is non-threatening, as if I was you know, putting paint everywhere, but, and you don't know what is threatening, what is non-threatening, so two things can happen. The first one, everything becomes threatening. This is called anxiety. The second thing that can happen, nothing is threatening anymore, I don't care. This is called burnout or depression. For sure it's more complicated than that, but basically, this is exactly what happens to the brain when you are chronically exposed. So you understand that it is very important to control the stress response. Tell the brain, calm down, this is not a mammoth. The brain does not know, I think, that we are in 2018. It doesn't make a difference between a mammoth in prehistorical time and a lady threatening your ego at the coffee machine every Tuesday morning. So each time it will produce a stress response. Now think about how many nuts you have per day and you will understand why we stress so much. So it is so important to control the stress response and so difficult at the same time. You know why? I've been giving conference to the public for 10 years, well, even more. And each time I say, I'm gonna save the people with everything I learn. And no, no adult wants to do everything we suggest to them. Why? Because they always tell me, why should I control my stress? Eh, now, do you, don't you have a pill? No, by the way. And <laughs> why should I control my stress? I'm the only one suffering from stress. And th they don't want to do it. Kids, by the way, are better. I've done programs with teenagers, and they're so good. Parents don't want to do it. They're so stubborn. I have the answer for the parents now. It's very Machiavellic. I'm going to give it to you anyway. So the next time anyone asks you, why should I control my stress, here's the answer, because it's spillover on those you like. In 2001, this is why I came out of the lab to talk to people. I found for the first time spillover effects of parental stress on children. I found that the more mom and dad, mostly mom, because it's very difficult to test dad, we can talk about this later, just because they hand the phone to mom, that's the only reason, I'm not joking. So the more mom is stressed and depressed, the more her own child produces stress hormones. Why? Because she becomes the mammoth. If you come back every day very upset at home, be sure that your child has the capacity to detect the next characteristics and they will produce stress hormones. Now, as Michael told you and many others will tell you today, stress hormones in a developing brain is a very very bad idea. I'm not joking about this. So the, no one can get out of this conference now thinking that your stress doesn't spill over on those you like. It doesn't happen. And each time I tell this to parents, I know exactly how they feel, exactly like this. So they remember the last time they shout at their child, you know, and they say, that's it, bad parent, I killed a couple of neurons. <laughs> and I always tell them, no, use this knowledge to deal with it. So this is what I propose to parents, and perhaps you will want to put this. Until we find ways to 
stop stress in children. This is what I say to parents. It is the same thing as in the air, you know, in the, in the oh yeah, a plane, when the hostess says, if there is a depressurization of air in the airplane and the mask falls, put it on yourself before putting it on your children. Parents always talk to me about the stress of their children, and they're so stressed when they talk to me about this that the first thing I want to tell them is that for the next year, just start by decreasing your stress by 50%. Just do this, and you will decrease by 50% the stress of your children. We found that because of the spillover. Just do this, and you will see it very fast. Everything will open up, and life will be much better. After this, I will talk about stress in children, not before. So parents tell me, what should I do? Two ways we have found. We have been starting to study out ways to decrease stress hormones. This is what I want to do in humans for the last six years. I don't have a, a lot of things to propose to you. Let me tell you what works. The first thing, it's called deconstructing stress. Many people tell me they are stressed out. They don't even know how and why. Well, if you don't know where the mammoth is, it will be quite difficult to kill it, right? So each time you have a, something coming up to your mind, the stressor comes in, Sarah is stressing me, fine, jump on it. Not Sarah, the idea. Hmm? <laughs> Why is she stressing me? Is she novel? No. Is she unpredictable? No. Does she threaten my ego? Yes. Hmm. Does she decrease my sense of control? Yes, well, two out of four eliminated. A well-defined problem is a problem almost solved. Once you have, by doing this, you will contextualize your stressor. You will find out that different situations stress you for different reasons. Sarah stresses you because she threatens your ego. Traffic stresses you because it's unpredictable. Nothing to do with each other. You will also find out that each one of you, you're more sensitive to one of the four characteristics. Me, it's unpredictability. Someone else, it can be control, etc. Organize your life accordingly to decrease as much stress as you can, when you can. Once you have deconstructed the stressor, don't stop there. You have to reconstruct the stressor. You need a plan B. The reverse word for stress is not relaxation, it's resilience. Resilience is the capacity to have a plan B, C, D, I once went to V. That was a big stressor. <laughs> so, Sarah stresses me because she threatens my ego. Fine, what should I do so that, you know, I have a feeling that she doesn't threaten my ego? And then you find plan B, plan C. What you have to understand is that 85% of people will never put into action their plan B. I don't care. Why? Because we have shown that the mere fact of having a plan B, the next time you have a stressor, you bring back to consciousness the plan B, it tells your brain you have control, and it stops producing stress hormones. That's all I want to do. The rest, I don't care. So this works quite well. We do this with children. We do this with teenagers. If you're a psychologist, try this. Very simple. You put this. They put the stress situation, the nuts characteristics. They put an X where it is. They find out which one is the most often circled. They find plan B, plan C. They love doing it, and they're much better than adults, by the way. We also teach children and adults to use their body. The body is an amazing tool to decrease a stress response. Think about it. The body brought you here. Do you think it cannot stop a stress response by itself? Oh, yes, it can. The first way to stop a stress response is to do belly breathing. Uh, to do the biggest belly when, when you put air in your body. Why? Because once you put a lot of air in your body, you will extend the diaphragm, you know, the pink thing on my slide. And at the best, the more you extend it, the bigger it gets. And at a certain type, at a certain level of extension, paf, you will activate the parasympathetic vagal system that stops the stress response right away. It works beautifully with children. It works beautifully with adults and not at all with teenagers. I tried with 500 of them. <laughs> they don't want to. So I found other ways for them to do this. The best way to do belly breathing, and now they do this in schools, sing. When you sing, you do belly breathing and you decrease stress hormones. Simple as that. The second way, this I always say to people, please lose the energy you mobilize. Lose the energy you mobilize, because if you do not lose it, you know where it will go in those you love. Me, I once said in a public conference at which my neighbor was attending, that me, I only do jogging when I'm stressed out. So each time I was coming back from my jogging, you know, my, my neighbor would be there like, everything is okay. <laughs> 
So I moved. <laughs> True. But not because of my neighbor, but I moved. So I had to put my kids in a new school at seven and nine years of age. I knew it was stressful. I knew they were not characteristics. So for one month, we are two kilometers from school. I went every day after school at school, walking. And then when my kids came out, I said, give me your bags and you run to the house because I knew they had mobilized energy and I wanted them to lose it. They never said a word, they did it. After a month, my daughter said, okay, mom, there's no more mammoths. I said, okay, I'm going back to the lab. <laughs> sure. Many school teacher will tell me it's very difficult to have girls move more than boys. I have a trick for you. Darwin's law says everything that has no purpose should be eliminated, right? Question for you, why do we still have music? What do you think that the hunters of mammoth were doing in prehistorical time after the, the chase? They were dancing around the fire at the sound of music. What were they doing while dancing? They were losing the mobilized energy. You have no idea how many times when I saw my kids coming back home being stressed out, I would say, oh, huh? I would put Britney Spears, and I said, we dance. And then my kids would say, mom, you're so cool. No, I'm Machiavellic, but that's fine. <laughs> Try this. Kids, kids are much better than we are at decreasing their stress response because they follow their intuition, and many times we will stop them. I'm not sure we should do this. The last one, laugh. Studies have shown that the same brain region that, stress, that, that is activated during a stress response is deactivated when we laugh. And I'm sure it happened to you, you come back from a very stressful day and you give a very bad joke and you cannot stop laughing. I'm sure it's a short circuit or something. <laughs> but what we know so far is that each time we laugh, we decrease, we decrease the stress response. So let me finish by telling you something. I think that everything we do in life that would not allow us to kill a mammoth sends the message to our brain that it's not a mammoth and that's what we want. But if we come back every Monday morning at, at work very upset, the brain will say, yes, a mammoth, let's go. And you will produce enough stress hormones to kill yourself alone in your office. That's basically what we have learned so much. I know that you will not remember all this, and for me, doing public translation of what we find is so important. So we have created the Center for Studies on Human Stress. Everything on this site is free. Everything on this site is pure science coming out of the lab. You have the address upstairs, humanstress.ca. Every time we learn something from iLab, the lab of Michael, or any other lab in the world, we put it there. It's written for the public. Everyone understands when you go there. And it doesn't look like it. But if you go in the section stress, stress and you, there's so much information. And if you go on the website, you will have the chance to download our free magazine called the Mammoth Magazine. What else? <laughs> And we have many, many issues of the Mammoth magazine in Canada. We have many doctors giving this to patients. We have nothing to sell, pure science. You take whatever you want in there, but it's there for you. We have many issues. Uh, this one, for example, stress in children and parents. Is it the same? Then we have, uh, we have, we have stress at work. Hmm. Stress in teenagers. My last one, new technologies and stress. And the one coming in September, anxiety. So all these things that I think are very, very important for uh, people, you know, school counselors, public, etc. This is what we do. Thank you very much.